let's unshackle our thinking and think like God does. God's heavenly account, God's heavenly declaration has made me the righteousness of God. Because of that, cancer, tumors, sickness, pain, we have deliverance, we have healing, we have freedom, we are, we are living in the victory and the liberty of Jesus Christ. We're not scanning the horizon to see whether we we, uh, we, uh, we, we can have it, whether it's justified for us. We look into heaven, and there it's already been declared. Hallelujah. Galatia, did, what did I tell you? Romans chapter 6. Hallelujah, something's happening. Somebody's back is getting healed right now. Glory be to God. Somebody's back is moving by the power of God right now. Woo, glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Pain in the stomach, in the abdomen area is being gone in the name of Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Somebody's blood sugar issue that comes, I think, I think the way I hear it's from the thyroid. Comes from the thyroid. We, it's being healed right now. In the name of Jesus, things are being adjusted in your body. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That means the whole, the whole of sin has been done away with and has no right to judge us anymore. And then our conduct, we don't live in slavery to sin anymore. The power not to sin is to be free from sin. You, you know as well as I do, the harder you try, it seems like the more it gets a grip on you. I mean, trying isn't powerful enough over this thing. But liberty and grace in Christ is powerful enough. The first step to being free is to be free. That means while you're struggling with the thing, you get free from the condemnation of it. And that's the, that's the power of the New Testament gospel is that we get free first. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Not when you're free from your deeds. Whom He has set free is free indeed. Let Him set you free from the condemnation of it and then you can get free from it. That's where the power is. Glory, hallelujah. Now look at the living translation of the Bible. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 6. I love the wording here. Is it on the screen there? We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. <laughs> Woo, glory, hallelujah. Sin has lost its power. Its power to separate. Its power to condemn. Its power to judge. Friend, when they sinned in the garden, they were immediately separated. They were driven from the garden. Sin has lost its power to do that. If it hadn't lost its power. Somebody says, oh, are you saying that sin doesn't? Listen, you come on to church and learn this stuff. Because if sin hasn't, hadn't lost its power to condemn you and separate you, you would be unsaved this morning. Because somewhere in the code, you broke it today. 
You did not live in perfect love of God this morning. If you, if you even had a thought of not coming to church, that was contrary. Now, whatever it is. If you just had a thought. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? If sin had not lost its right and ability to judge See, we, we get so holy and put our nose out there and get so holy and squared up in our shoulders and go, well, are you saying that? Are you saying that sin is not? It's not. And you know, like as though you really were that holy. <laughs> but if you stop and look at it like a lawyer, take the scriptures and put it together and go, wait a minute, what is the gospel really saying? Then you'd have to conclude sin doesn't have the power anymore. Because if sin had the power, then every one of us this morning should get up, raise our hand and go, I just want to tell you, I'm Stephen Schlebach and I'm a sinner. And I can't stop sinning. And I'm in trouble with God because I'm a sinner. And every day we ought to stand up and just confess, I'm a sinner. But that we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that because sin has lost its power to judge us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hence, people say, well, doesn't that mean that people are going to try to sin a lot and all of that? Hey, listen, if you love Jesus and have received his love and you still want to sin in, the, in your heart of hearts, we got an altar call for you this morning. Uh, I'm telling you, we've been telling people for a long time to quit this and quit that and quit that. And I've been a pastor for 20 some years and I'm telling you, people are still sinning. The, the, the power to get over sin is to get free from it first. I am convinced the more you bind the sin to a person, the more power it has over them. I'm convinced from the gospel, the freer you get them from the sin, the freer they're going to get from the sin. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, praise you, Lord God. Oh, we, how much time do we have? Yeah, that's what you say. You should hear. <laughs> Somebody says all day, but there's 50 other people going, I wish we were out of here. <laughs> Mama's got casserole in the stove. <laughs> <laughs> so the next phrase in the verse is Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. Oh, glory. We're just, we haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet. <laughs> Christ lives in me. For, don't turn here. Just if, if you're taking notes, I'll just reference them quickly. 1 John 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we. As he is, so are we. So this crucified life, Paul says, I'm living now, is also a life of Christ in me. And that's not, again, it's going to become actions in our life. But it's not just action, it's a condition. The condition of my life as I live it now is one of Christ in me. Shoo! Now... And then Colossians 1.20, one that's very familiar, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of your worth, the hope of your value is Christ in you. The hope of glory means the hope of your worth, the hope of your weight, the hope of your glory, the hope of your value to God is Christ in you. How valuable am I today? Woo, glory. The world can't judge me. I don't look to the world to figure it out. All I do is look to Christ in me. 
The hope of the glory that I'm walking in is Christ in me. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's some people today that need to let go of the things that have happened in their past that are happening even now in your life and go, Christ in me is my value. Christ in me is the hope of glory. I'm not measuring what I'm worth by what's happened to me around me or what is even going on now. My worth is Christ in me. It, you, listen, I, I, I got to move on, but I just, I love this scripture. Paul is saying, you guys are saying that if you receive this sign of the covenant, you'll be worth something. You'll be Abraham's children. And Paul's saying, no, no, no. Christ in me is what makes me worth something. Hallelujah. Christ in me. And then the, the last two phrases we got to quickly look at is, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, again, I, I, I've learned this as a child in the old King James version of the Bible. And the new King James and other translations say, the life I now live, um, let's see, I live by faith in the Son of God. I like the old King James because it says, the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And the reason I like that, I, I don't just like it because it's nice wording. I like it because I believe that they might have it right. Because usually when it is faith in, it names Jesus Christ. Now just think with me for a minute. In most cases when it says that you believe in him, in Jesus, in Jesus Christ... But in this verse, it says, Son of God, which causes me to believe that by the faith of the Son of God would mean something like this. The life I live is with the same confidence of the Son of God. It's His confidence that I live by. <laughs> Woo, glory, hallelujah. It's His Oh, my God. Hallelujah. If you felt what I felt up here, you would act worse than I'm acting. <laughs> oh, my lands. Hallelujah. The, whew, the life I... <laughs> oh. It's hard to stand. I tell you, my legs are shaking like a leaf. I feel heaven saying, yes, listen... The life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Do you get it? I live my life with the same confidence of the Son of God because it is in Him that I live. He is my life. I'm crucified with Christ. Nothing can judge me in this realm. I am as He is, so am I. And the life I live is with that faith, with His faith. As confident as He is about the storm is how confident I am. As confident as he would be praying a prayer is how confident I am because I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. Hallelujah. And don't you know that we are the ones who are made sons. We are not first, second, third, fourth son. We are in him, which means we are first son. There is only one son when it comes to quality and relationship. There's only one son. So when you're a son of, you are not, he's not firstborn, you secondborn. You are born in him. Which, be, <laughs> which means you have and can walk in the faith of the son of God. Hallelujah! Your faith is no less than His. And of course, we know that comes from faith in Him. So however you want to interpret it is fine with me, but I'm just telling you, I don't need that phrase to tell me that I can have the same confidence He has. Because Scripture says we are co-heirs with Him. 
Romans 8, 17. We're co-heirs with him. That means I live with the same trust, the same confidence, the same faith as he. Let's finish up. Last phrase. Who loved me. <laughs> and gave himself for me. Glory, hallelujah. Who loved me and gave himself for me. That tells me how much he loved me. But listen, I totally understand if you think this is talking about him giving himself on the cross, and it sure includes that. He gave himself, what an amazing work, that a man would lay down his life for another. He gave himself for us on the cross. That's an act of his selfless love for us. But let's play with the English language a little bit. Who gave himself for us. What about it not being an act, but rather a possession? That he loved us so much, he gave himself for us. Loved us so much that he made so that we could have himself and be in the same quality as him. He loved me. He gave himself to me. He loved me so much that he gave himself so that when I come before the Father, the Father doesn't see me, the crucified one, he sees me in the resurrected Christ. And when I stand before the Father, he loved me so much, Jesus did, that he gave me himself. So that the same way he would be accepted is the same way I am accepted. <laughs> loved me so much, he gave me himself. We wouldn't say to somebody, now, now look, now look, uh, they gave us a gift. You know, my wife wouldn't say to me that, you know, this morning at church, so-and-so gave you some candy. Well, I wouldn't look at that as an act that they did that doesn't say, I own the candy. They're giving it to me. They're giving it. And I would go and say, they gave me. They gave me this stuff. If he says he gave himself for me, he's saying he himself was for me. Now, there's plenty of other scriptures to 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 make this case from. But friend, we're not looking at the world. We're not looking at anything in this realm. We're looking to him. And he gave himself so that when we look, we go, I'm like him. Oh, you want to know how I am? I look at him. See, people, we've been conditioned to look at him to see how we should act. And seeing how we should act gets really old. What causes you to act right is to get your focus off the acting and get your focus on the being. So people say things like, what would Jesus do? Or let's, you know, let's try to act like him, I would say let's first be, be him. I don't mean taking his place. Is, you understand what I'm saying? He gave us this place in him. Being. I'll, I'll tell you, I, 
I, I wish I had a whole week just to teach you on this stuff. Because you, it's everywhere in the Bible. It's just everywhere. Jesus himself said it, and it's what offended people. Communion. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Oh, what's he saying? Unless you take me in, unless it becomes, unless I become you. You can't enter in. You can't have me. You can't be in this kingdom. You can't. It doesn't work by you keeping the law. It doesn't work by things. It doesn't work by actions. It works by taking me, eating my flesh, and drinking my blood. This was not some bizarre thing he was trying to tell them. He's telling them a truth. You've got to ingest. You've got to take me. You've got to let me be you. And now you have part with me. I can illustrate it with another story if you got one more minute. Remember the prodigal son? Remember the prodigal son who said to his father, Give me my inheritance. Remember? And the father gave him the inheritance. What did he have? He had all the stuff from the father. But when he went out away from the father, the stuff didn't last at all. It was gone in a hurry. It didn't satisfy. And when he found satisfaction again, it was back with him. Friend, we have spent decades in the church telling people about the stuff. And that's why we got unhappy Christians because the stuff runs out. The stuff doesn't fulfill. The stuff, the inheritance is not exactly what you need. You need him. He didn't promise you all the stuff without him. The son found his security not with his possessions. It's not the healing. It's not the freedom. It's not the financial prosperity we've heard about forever that's going to satisfy us. What's going to satisfy us is a standing in Him. You put your focus on that stuff and you'll get dissatisfied really quick. But you get rooted and grounded in who you are in Christ and what He is in you and you'll find none of that can judge you. You could go through the rest of your life sick as a dog and be just as happy and secured in Him. I believe He wants to heal you, but I'm just saying you won't measure yourself by that stuff. I'm fighting all these battles. I don't even know if God loves me. Of course He loves you. He gave Himself for you. Glory, hallelujah. The prodigal son had it all. He had the whole inheritance, but wasn't, wasn't no time at all until he was eating with the pigs. Because if it's actions, if it's stuff, we're trying to get from Jesus, it gets old real fast. If you go to church as an action to try to just get brownie points, to get please Jesus, you know, let's try to do what we ought to do. Let me tell you, in six months from now, you'll be sitting at home watching television. But if you go to church, if you do the things not as an action, but as who you are. Now we got life. Now we've got life. Glory, hallelujah. Because you can have all the possessions of the inheritance. If you go to church to try because you need healing, you go to church because you need, you go to church, then as soon as that need is answered, you're going to leave. But if the real heart is him, Paul said that I may gain him. Hallelujah. That prodigal son found out real satisfaction comes in the presence in the father's house. He is really my inheritance. God with me is the inheritance I really need. Whoo, glory, hallelujah. Praise your Lord. So how's God see us today? 
the life I now live, I live in Christ. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Glory, hallelujah. Well, that's easy for you to say. You seem so perfect and you seem to do everything so right. You still hadn't got it. You just still haven't got it. Keep coming back. We'll saturate you some more because you're still comparing. You're still looking at stuff. You're still deciding whether you're in the Father's house based on what you have in your hand. If that were the case, the prodigal son might have never gone back. But it wasn't about what he had or didn't have. It was about where he was. And let me tell you, you may be struggling with stuff. You may be battling things. You may have things that you are, have a hard time shaking off. Listen, let's get the focus off of it. Get you in the Father's house, secure in the life you now live. And let him work on that other stuff because it's no longer you that lives, but Christ lives in you. <laughs> How? Hallelujah! Christ lives in me. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. I just confess to you I'm completely drunk on this truth. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> You may get drunk on other things, but I get drunk on the truth of his word. I'm like a staggering man this morning, just carrying the weight and the glory of the truth of God's grace and Jesus Christ. Paul said, I don't know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because he knew what that meant. Hallelujah. So when those voices come, from people, your head, the enemy, your actions, your past, your future, and say, you don't, you can't, you're not worthy, you can't pray, you can't have confidence, what are you going to say? I am crucified with Christ. <laughs> How can you judge me? I'm crucified with him, and the life I now live is his life. That's what walking by faith is all about. That's the highest level of faith. You can play with it, exercise it, should. Believing for money, believing for this, believing for that. But I'm telling you, the highest level of beginning, greatest measure of faith is that you're walking not by sight, but by faith in your relationship with him. <laughs> <laughs>